Okay, hello. Um, so as usual, I'm gonna start by saying where we are in the book. Um, Where the accounts have a lot of the first part of the public national analytics. Second part is the dialogue. Within the channel, it's transcendental analytics, there's two parts analytical principles. Sorry, the analytical process. The thing with there is um, two parts or three parts actually the schematism, the discuss last time, system of principle. Part of the reading for this time, and then phenomena and union. I'm talking about next time, and then after that, phenomena and human are has an appendix. The concept of reflection. And, and then it will go on to the dialogue. So, so today is about the system of principles now like the system of principles is long and complicated i think the reading for today is too long and yet it's uh, also too short because we really should read the whole system of principles but uh there isn't time um so uh so remember the overall plot here um What, so what the analytic of concepts ended up requiring all put together is that um, whatever is given in inner sense has to be, uh, so to speak, representable by the imagination as an image of the categories. Um, Right, I mean, Kant says the categories don't have have images in the way, let's say, the concept dog has images. So, like, what is the image? Kant says that the schema, the right, this is the. What is an unfold in sense? And the schema is the way the imagination goes through that. And Todd also describes it as saying the imagination produces the manifold in sense as an image of the concept. So, like, that's why there's one, the concept has one schema, but it has many possible images. All the different ways a dog could be sent, basically. Right? And he says the same thing about a mathematical concept like triangle. Uh, uh, this is partly his answer to Barclay's argument, as you can even tell from the way he phrases it, right? Like Barclay says, well, uh, abstract concepts are absurd because um, how can you have a concept of a triangle that's neither right nor obtuse nor scaling on nor, you know, right? Like the different characteristics of the different triangles contradict each other. So, you know, Kant says, well, there's, yeah, there's many images, possible images of the concept triangle, but there's only one schema. Schema is the way the imagination goes through. Anything to produce it as an image of a concept triangle. 
Oh, so like so so concepts, strictly speaking, the concepts don't have images. It's just a, in a it's just a penis of them, right? It can't, concepts have no image because um, um, because it's a pure a priori concept and. Um, it doesn't inside the concept say anything about what kind of experiences you should have to match it. Right? I mean, it can't because it's not specific to our form of sensible intuition. Right? It's something like any discursive intellect would be. So, um, so, so the speak doesn't have images, but in another sense, sometimes Kant calls the form of inner sense the pure image of the category. I mean, like a pure image is kind of a, it's almost a contradiction in terms, but I mean, I think in terms of this picture, you can see what it means. I think you're going to see the well, I mean, <laughs> but the pure image means that. So to speak, there's a way the transcendental imagination goes through the pure manifold of in time, but it's pure temporal manifoldness in such a way as to show it as an image of the category. What that really means is that when you use a category to form an empirical concept, the imagination will be able to go through some actual manifold of sensations in time in such a way as to form an image of that empirical concept insofar as you use that category to, to make it right and to make any empirical concept you use all the categories because again the categories are just the pieces of the understanding itself so Right, so that's why I was saying, so like to get back to how I started on this, the analytic of concepts, so to speak, says that the transcendental imagination can produce the time as a pure image of the categories. But less, so to speak, it says that the actual manifold of sensations has to be such that the transcendental imagination, that, that the regular old imagination can go through them in such a way as to form an image of some empirical concept. So then, so that's what the analytic of concepts require. And then the analytic of principles starts with the schematism that says, okay, so what does that mean? What does the imagination have to be able to do in the case of each of the categories? And then the system of principles um, starts with the highest principle of all synthetic judgments, which in a sense is a summary of what I just said about the analytic concepts, right? It says that, you know, uh, uh, the object given in sense must conform to the conditions of synthetic unity of the understanding. And then using, at least this is what we expect to happen, using the information from the schematism, it's now going to be able to crank principles out of it. Right. So, like, for example, we know that the manifold given in sense must be such that the imagination can do whatever it is it needs to do to represent uh, what's affecting me as um, um, as an empirical quantum. Right, as something that uh, uh, empirically, among other things, is like its concept, among other things, is a like application of the category of quantum. And a schema term will tell, will tell you what that means, namely that it must be possible to measure it up and, and like count its parts. So, so that's why, like the first principle, this is this was not part of the meeting, but the first principle, the principle corresponding to quantity, is that uh, every object of experience is an extensive quantum. Um, um, 
right so this that's how this is supposed to work in general um and therefore there's you know like for each heading of the categories there's either a principle or a set of principles Now, I mean, when you look into it, once again, you find basically like one principle for quantity, one principle for quantity, and then for relation, you find, well, a relation is a little weird. You find like one summary principle, so to speak, but then it has three sub principles. Um, and for modality, there isn't even a summary principle, it's just three principles. Right, so again, as in the schema system, we have like one thing here, one thing here, but then three here, three here. Okay, but the titles, however, are all plural. So, like, as if you could fill in the three sub principles here, I'm not sure what they would be, but right, so these are called axioms of intuition. These are called anticipations. Perceptions. These are called analogies of experience. And these are called postulates of you want to write postulates of the empirical plot in general. So, um, um, there's a couple of things to say about this. One is that, you know, uh, there ought to be, obviously has to be an explanation for why there's two series here, axioms, anticipations, analogies, and postulates, and intuition, perception, experience, and empirical thought in general. In, in, in general means like as such, like empirical humor talks, so it's like empirical thought, there we go. Just think about that. So um, um so Kant does give explanations at various points of why he chose those particular terms and so forth. The explanations are not always that easy to understand. <laughs> um, I will try to understand, explain in particular why these are called analogies. Um, um, the other thing to notice about it is that this series here um, pretty clearly has an order to it. Um, this is the difference between perception and intuition, generally speaking, Kant says in several places, including here, is that um, a perception is an intuition insofar as it contains actual sensation. So, like every actual empirical intuition is a perception. Um, but 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 this uh, like distinction means that here we're not thinking about the sensations. We're just talking of thinking about the form of intuition, it, right? Without worrying about the sensations yet, so to speak. Um, whereas here we bring in sensations, and then here we bring in like relationships between perceptions, because like one perception implies another one, or something like. Um, and then here we relate all of that back to our faculty of empirical thought. Because as usual, the category of modality is like not something further about the object, but it's about the relationship between the object and us. 
Um, so, uh, so this is a hint at something that, and I, I think this is true. Uh, I mean, it might seem kind of obvious. I don't know if it seems obvious to you or not, but I know it has not seemed obvious to all readers of this book. And it didn't seem obvious to me at first when I read it. But, but these are in order. <laughs> okay, it's not just like a random list of things that you can prove. Um, I mean, the categories have an order to them, and there's a reason for that order, and you can start to see part of the reason for that order in the order of these principles, um, or, or it's reflected in one way in the order of these principles. And in particular, like each one when you state it presupposes the other one. Right, so like the statement of the analysis of experience presupposes that we've already shown that the objects of our experience, number one, have an extensive quantity, at least in time, right? So they have like a duration and that um, they contain a degree of some power to affect us, to cause sensation either directly or indirectly. We don't know a priori what that is, right? Degree of what or how they can affect us. That we find out by experience. But I mean, you can tell from past examples what kind of thing it is. It's like uh, density, right? Like mass density, like specific gravity. Right, that, like that's an example. So, um, um, so like an object of experience is something like a certain density spread over a certain region. So the analysis of experience, the way the analysis of experience are stated and proved and so forth, it's all already assumed that we've shown this. So like when we're talking about um, uh, in the first analogy about the permanence of substance, what that ends up meaning is that the quantum of substance in the universe is conserved. And uh, um, like, again, we don't know in advance what kind of, we don't know a priori exactly what it means that the like quantum of what? It's the quantum of some something that consists in a degree spread over a region or something like that. But again, like a posteriori, we know examples of this at least. And so the conservation of mass is supposed to be an ex like a example of an application of the first analogy. And similarly, when he gets to the second analogy, um, he's now assumes that we're talking about permanent substances that can change their state. And the change of state of a substance is a change in degree of some, uh, that is some respect in which it can have more or less reality, exist more or less. While at the same time, it's like fundamental, substantial reality, the, the degree of that remains the same. So like, for example, motion. Right, that's what he's he's thinking of. Right? I mean, um, that uh, a substance like the mass is always conserved, but it's uh, like the relative motions change in response to moving forces. And you know, uh, so like the examples that he gives. Uh, the, the most famous example is of the boats going down the stream in the in the brief of the second analogy, there's a discussion of the second analogy. There's boats going down the stream. Um, so what's the cause and what's the effect here? So the cause. And like it's, I think this is something that's really important to understand about this example. 
You may have said the performance. Did I say the performance class? I don't know. Anyway, even if I said the performance, I'm going to say it again. What's the cause? Um, well, the cause is the mass of the Earth. Or the Earth as a substance. And what is it causing? Well, basically, it's causing these shifts that accelerate in this direction. Yeah, you may say, wait, they're not accelerating in that direction. They're moving in this direction at a constant speed. But, you know, that's due to a combination of the effect of this cause and other causes. Like, I mean, if you, you know, like, why do, why do we have boats go down a river rather than, like, next to the river on the river bank? <laughs> well, you know, because, uh, the water helps keep the boats from accelerating too fast. <laughs> <It's on the laughs> where friction would stop them. <laughs> right? I mean, if this were sufficiently slippery, we wouldn't need the water. We could just let the boats slide down there. Um, and then, you know, I think that would make it clearer what's going on. There's, you know, the boat's trying to accelerate towards the center of the earth, but of course, it can't go straight towards the center of the earth because. Uh, the ground is stopping, so it does the best to connect in and goes this way. And if the ground has a little bit of friction, then instead of accelerating, it will, you know, go at a constant speed. So I mean, like, uh, you know, when when Kant in other places talks about the laws of physics and so forth, and you know, he makes it clear he thinks of um, the actual motion of a body as a result of the different forces that are acting. So, like, so that, so, so, like, this boat is, so to speak, is really accelerating this way, but it's also, you know, being pushed in a different direction and they balance out so that this goes down the stream. So, you know, so, like, that's all a complicated way of just to go back and say that, you know, so what's happening is that these boats, you know, they have a certain mass and they also, are in a certain state of motion. And because of this other substance here that has a certain mass, that state of motion is changing. That is, that they're accelerating. Uh, so, there's, so we know because of the previous principles that this is all my examples have to be like. Um, one of the few examples of the book that's not about gravitation is the one about the fire feeding the room. And I'm not sure I understand how it kind of fits with that. But the other two, right, there's, there's this example on the, besides the fire feeding the room, there's an example of a lead ball on a cushion. Here again, the cause is the earth acting on the, the ball. Right? Um, so, you know, like these are both consequences of that one important synthetic a posteriori judgment that Kant used as an example early on, all bodies are heavy. What does it mean that all bodies are heavy? It means they act to change each other's state of motion. They act on each other to change each other's state of motion. Um, Okay, uh, so 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 that's about the order here. Now, it's like given if there really is an order like that, then that shows even more clearly why we should read the whole thing from beginning to end in order to follow the order. But again, there isn't really time for that. So, I mean, uh, as I was saying after class last time, you know, we could do a class on like. Some people teach this book and only go up to the transcendental deduction. <laughs> but, I mean, we could, I, I'm sure I could spend 10 weeks just talking about the transcendental effect. <laughs> but, I, you know, but I think, and I think it's better to strike a balance, I guess. Um, I don't know if I struck it correctly, but going sort of like through as much of the book as you. As you humanly can, I mean, just <laughs> I 
in order to get the big picture rather than getting bogged down in some particular part. So this is this is the point at which so I'm mostly going to talk about the second analogy and a little bit about the postulates. Which, um, and I'll turn to the those reading because mostly because it's going to be important later to know what they say. Um, I guess there's one other thing I want to say about this overall structure, and then I'm going to go on to talk about the analogies, which is that, um, well, let me just read what he says. This is on uh, B223, it's page 211 in Kemp Smith. Um, Right. right, so this is in the analogies. It's in the introductory section about all the analogies. Um, but, uh, but the sentence itself is about the postulates of empirical thought in general. And it says, um, the postulates of empirical thought in general, which concern the synthesis of mere intuition, that is the form of appearance, of perception, that is of the matter of perception, and of experience, that is of the relation of these perceptions. So in other words, he's saying that the three postulates here, the postulate of possibility, of actuality or existence and of necessity saying this one is about um, the synthesis of your intuition. This is about the synthesis of perception. And this is about the synthesis of experience, that is, of the relation of these perceptions. So the, the three principles of modality correspond to the three previous sections, intuition, perception, experience. And I mean, if you look at the, uh, the postulates themselves, this is a, uh, uh, bottom of B265 in the front, Kemp Smith, page 239. The first postulate is that which agrees with the formal conditions of experience, that is, with the conditions of intuition and of concepts, is possible. That which is bound, the second one is that which is bound up with the material conditions of experience, that is, with sensation, is actual. And the third one is that which in its connection with the actual is determined in accordance with universal conditions of experience is, that is, exists as necessary. So, I mean, it's a little harder to hear in the official formulation, but I think if, if you think about what those things mean, again, you'll see that this one is basically involves mere intuition, this one involves perception, and this one involves a relation of perception to each other, that is experience. So, I mean, that's another way, again, of seeing how, like, in my kind of uh, extended table of the categories, right, which I, I put up the PDF on, if you want to see it, I emphasize this, that these three are the objective categories. And then this one is about the relation um, of the object to the subject. And so this one covers all of these 
as they relate it back to the sun. Um, and if you add in the, you know, the subjective moments, those things that are discussed in section 12, the convertible, the things that I call the convertible transcendental, you can see that there's kind of three moment progression here that's similar to the three moments across in the table of categories. It's like the same. So even though, like, in when you first look at it, it looks like the table of categories is four by three. So that there must be two different structures, one that gets you three and the other that gets you four. I think it turns out that if you look at it the right way, it's really three by three. All right. Um, this, you know, as usual, I'm saying this partly because if you're interested in Hegel, but I don't know if anyone is. <laughs> anyone will, some, someone is someone else. I'm anyway, okay. Um, are there questions about that before I go on to talk about the analogies? Um, okay, so I'm going to erase this. I'm going to erase all of it. You know, there's a joke that they. Uh, They were trying to figure out which was the cheapest department in the university. And at first they thought it was the math department because all they need is a pencil, uh, paper, and an eraser. But then they realized that the philosophy department is cheaper because they don't need the eraser. <laughs> all right, anyway, but the blackboard didn't give me the eraser. All right, so, um, so like, the argument of the second analogy, the proof of the second analogy is um, is one of the most famous arguments in the book. So that's, you know, like one of the reasons why if I was going to include something from the system of principles, it was going to have to be that. Um, why is it one of the most famous arguments in the book? I mean, part of it is because this is the explicit response to Hume, right? So which... Kant himself emphasizes the importance of Hume in setting him on the track uh, to writing this book, um, like realizing what a serious problem Hume had raised and responding to it. And this is where he responds, you know, uh, to most explicitly to an argument that Hume actually makes. Um, so that's a good reason. Another good reason, I'm not sure if this is if people think about this as much, but it they should think about it, which is that like the second analogy um, is about kind of like the very point where theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy might seem like they could contradict each other. Right? Because that that is that every event has a cause seems like a denial of the possibility of free will. So um, when we get to uh, the um, third antinomy in the dialectic, we'll see that the second analogy is in the background of like the prop, the contradiction that Kant is trying to um, resolve. <laughs> um, okay, but another reason. And this, I feel, is like not as good a reason, or anyway, is a like a reason that should cause caution is that the argument in the second analogy seems a lot easier to follow than most of the other arguments in the system of principles, if not all. <laughs> now, I mean, it seems easier to follow, I think, maybe not when you try to read it in all its details, but just like when you kind of think of what it says in the summary way, it seems like um, um, you could state it pretty quickly. And it's something, this is what it seems like. And I mean, in some sense, this has to be true, but anyway, the, so the argument is, is the way people understand it is, well, there has to be a universal causal order if there's going to be objective order of events in time. 
Um, so that, I mean, then like you can ask, well, why? And, you know, and does, does the argument work or whatever? But um, like, as opposed to what he says, like, if you, even if you look at the proofs of the other analogies, let alone if you look at the anticipation of perception or whatever, that um, it seems like there's an argument you can kind of get your teeth into there, right? It's got a like, premise and a conclusion. And so, um, I think that's kind of like a warning sign that uh, either, so, I mean, if, if this seems much easier to understand than the other arguments and summarize than the other arguments in the system of principles, it means like either something different is going on here than in the other sections, in which case, well, first of all, that's, that would not be good for Kant, right? Because I uh, just erased this, but like if you remember the overall plot, the, the system of principles is supposed to be like one big application of the highest principle of all synthetic judgments. So, like all the arguments should, in some sense, work the same way. Um, so, if there's one that's really different from the others, that would be a problem for time. Um, also, it's a problem for us insofar as if that's true, then like what we can learn, what we could learn from analyzing this one argument would be limited, right? Because it wouldn't help us understand what's going on in the other arguments if it's really that much different than them. Um, um, so like that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the apparent easiness of this argument is only apparent. <laughs> And obviously, I'm going to argue for the second option. Um, um, so, uh, you know, meaning that, like, I'm, I'm still not sure I understand how this is supposed to work. I feel like year after year, I'm understanding it a little bit better. Um, right before class today, I felt like I was in the tip of my tongue, but then I ran out of time. I don't know. <laughs> But I mean, I understand some things about it. So, um, okay, so first of all, the analogies as a whole, and why are they called analogies? Is this the same as that single cell? Yes, it is. Even though you now understand less well than I did like an hour ago, how those how this goes together with other things. But it's okay. <laughs> I'll talking about this first. All right. So um so experience, like what's the difference between experience and perception? So the, you know, one way is what I was just saying before that experience involves the relation between perceptions. Um, but, and I mean, I think that's true according to Kant, but on the other hand, uh, I don't think that's the definition of experience. The, like by definition, the difference between experience and perception is that um, as long as we're just ta talking about intuition merely as perception, we're uh, still not distinguishing between it and its object. Whereas um, when we consider perception as a part of experience, we're thinking of it as a representation of an object that's different from the representation. So, um, so the, here's like, this is like not a system.
So um, when I represent an object that's different from the perceptions, what I'm doing is it's an empirical object. So I'm representing the object as having a principle in it because of which these perceptions have come in. Um, so this principle is in the object, it's not in me. But to represent an object, I have to set up my own principle, which is a constant. and represent the perceptions as conforming to my principle. Um, so, um, so the object of this concept is the object of this concept. Um, insofar as the principle that's in it is responsible for the possibility of using this principle to unify these perceptions. Um, right, so like the external principle of unity, which is in the object, and I don't have it. Um, if my concept could, could, uh, succeeds in representing this object, it will be because this external principle of unity, um, uh, through the manifold of its effects, generates perceptions that conform to this internal principle of unity. And, you know, so this is both why, um, well, you can see a bunch of things together here. One is why the being about the relation of perceptions, the experience being about the relation of perceptions, the same as experience being about an object that's distinct from the perceptions, that is, a principle of unity that's not contained in any of the perceptions, but that's somehow responsible for the manifoldness of them. And second of all, why you can see why you can't represent that without a constant. Right? So this is why, like, I, mean, I think it's often easier to understand when, when Kant says we can't have cognition of an object without both a concept and an intuition. It's often easier to understand why we need the intuition than why we need the concepts. Okay, but so in this picture, you can kind of see why we need both, right? Like if we just have perceptions, but we're not representing them as conforming to any principle, then we're not representing them as anything other than that manifold of, perfect, of perceptions. So we're not using them to represent an object. We use them to represent an object, we have to bring in our own principle of unity and say, okay, if you conform to this, I'm going to take you as perceptions of the ob of an object, namely the object of this concept. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, like, one way of putting this is that the series of perceptions must set up an analogy between the internal principle and the external Um. Um, 
that is, this is also, I think, what Locke calls resemblance. Right when Locke says that the the prime the the um, primary qualities resemble our ideas of it, he means that um, uh, the primary qualities are related to each other by necessary relations that are analogous to the necessary relations. In our ideas of it. so um, um, so that from the structure of our ideas of primary qualities, we learn something about the actual structure of the objects, as opposed to the secondary qualities, where all we learn is that the object causes those ideas in us, but we don't learn anything about the structure of the object. Um, So, um, I mean, resemblance can, in certain contexts, be an equivalent for analogy, and I think that's the way Locke is using it. All right. Anyway, I mean, but of course, Kant is different from Locke because Kant agrees with Hume that um, you know Locke essentially is like trying to do without this part and saying that we just. There's visible necessary connections between our ideas. In particular, the simple idea of solidity, according to Locke. Like, although it's a simple idea, just like the taste of a pineapple, like you can't define it or whatever, somehow when we have it, we know that um, something is going to resist our bringing our two hands together. Um, how do we know that? Well, it seems like Locke just says, well, it's just evident from a conception. It's evident from the, from the, somehow, from that simple idea, something that's not at all part of the idea is like comes in, right? So in other words, Locke's explanation of the possibility of synthetic a priori knowledge, which he's using in basically the same way Kant is, is just that, uh, well, we just see it, <laughs> right? So, but Kant, like you, thinks that doesn't make any sense. I could probably go into more detail about like exactly why it doesn't make sense, but I'm not going to here because I'm just trying to say what the difference between Kant and, and Locke is here. So, you know, so that's why um, Kant agrees with Hume that the perceptions themselves don't have any necessary connection between them. The necessary connection is something we have to demand. It's not something we receive. Right? Like, that is, according to Locke, when I put my hands around a football, I'm not sure if he's talking about what we call a football or soccer ball or some other intermediate kind of ball. But anyway, we put hands around a football. Um, the, it it affects us in such a way that we know we won't be able to bring our hands together. Like it causes us to know that something. So the cop says, and Hume say that's impossible. So Hume says, therefore, we don't know it really. But Kant is trying to explain how we do. That. <laughs> um, all right. Um, um, so anyway, like that, I think one, one reason for that digression in the lock is to make it more plausible, you know, so like, why is it that, that setting up this analogy means um, somehow establishing necessary relations between the perceptions? It's um, just abstractly speaking, it's like if there's a necessity here, let's say if I have to take the simplest possible case, so this, this doesn't really happen, right? The real cases aren't this simple. <laughs> let's say if I have this perception, I have to have this perception. 
So if that's true, then um, uh, it must be because the ability to produce this perception necessarily goes along with the ability to produce this perception. So when I represent this connection as necessary, I'm representing a connection in the object as necessary. Whereas on the other hand, when I represent this connection as contingent, I have this one, and I also happen to have this one, then all I'm saying here is, well, I was affected with this one, and I was affected with this one, but it doesn't tell me anything about the case. Like, just, you know, like Locke says, a simple sensation like white can't be false because there certainly is something that caused me to see what, and that thing is what. But, you know, I mean, I could be asleep and dreaming and something still caused me to see white, and you can call that thing white, even though it's a part of my brain, <laughs> right? Uh, it doesn't tell you at all what that thing is like. It doesn't give you any information about it other than it caused me to see white. So you're not really representing anything about the structure of of something, and therefore, you're not really representing anything except for just the perceptions themselves. So, what we need here is necessity. So, like, um, so this the schemata of the categories of relation. Um, are like explain how the um, a series of sensations in time can be such as to um, can have a relation to the object that's analogous to their relation. Um, can they have a relation to a principle in the object that's analogous to their relation to the principle in the subject? So, um, I mean, I drew these like in a, as a theory in a row, but uh, that, like that's basically illegitimate. Right? Like at this level of abstraction, I don't know what kind of order these perceptions have. But you know, if you fill in the, the order of our inner sense of time, then um, now you can say uh, what the manifold uh, in inner sense must be like if I can um, represent it as the effects of a single principle that's analogous to my single principle. And uh, uh, I mean, I guess like there's three different aspects of that corresponding to the three analogies. Um, they, one has to do with permanence, one has to do with expression, and one has to do with simultaneity. Um, so the one that has to do with succession says that um, I can represent it as analogous because my principle um, like requires a certain order of succession and not the reverse. So, or, so my concept represents that order of succession as necessary. Um, so if the sensations actually come in that order, then I, I can represent them as um, conforming to my principle because whatever it is that's affecting me uh, contains an analogous principle. I mean, I, 
I feel like the problem with what I just said is not so much that it seems wrong, is that it seems too obvious to be worth saying, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, you know, obviously one way I can represent something in a series in time as following from a principle that's analogous to my principle is if my principle prescribes a certain order. And it keeps that order, then I can represent it as being in that order because of a principle that's analogous to my principle, right? And so, I mean, it is supposed to be obvious in a sense, because again, like it is the only example we can give of something like that. Like, I mean, <clears throat> uh, everything we represent as being in a certain order has to be have the the, the type of order that time has. So there's really only one way of, um, <laughs> uh, of representing something as like spread out in an order. It, it, it has to be one after the other. Um, so I mean, so 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 the schema says so like the, so the schema of the category of cause and effect is regularity of the order of um, the perceptions in time. Um, And so the respect in which time itself is supposed to, so to speak, a pure image of the category of cause and effect is that um, uh, time itself prescribes an order like that. I mean, it's a, time itself is it's just one thing, right? It's like the common characteristic of all our inner intuitions. Um, so it's not exactly right, although Kant sometimes talks this way to say time itself contains, right? It's, it's not like time is made out of a whole bunch of mini times that are strung together in order, <laughs> right? It's rather that like, like, because that's our capacity for internal sense, um, we have to be affected in an order like that, meaning, we have to be affected by things one after another. So, um, so there's a kind of like built-in necessary direction here, and then when you form an actual empirical concept, you use that to um, um, uh, Like, if time didn't have this order to it, one time after another, where after each time there necessarily comes the next time. But again, it, it, that's a weird way of speaking about it. It's really like whatever impures in time has to do that, right? If, if it didn't have that, then we couldn't use uh, the order of time to establish this analogy because. Uh, would, there wouldn't be an order, so we wouldn't be able to ask whether V always follows A because there would be no such thing as following, right? So it's like the followingness of time or the successiveness of time, as Kant puts it, that um, in general, the imagination is producing an image of cause and effect. Um, but the application of that in, in any particular, you know, in our actual experience is, of course, not just that one time has to come after another, but uh, one sensation has to come after another in a determinate order. Um, so, um, therefore, and like, this, this is an important thing to notice, and I think it's also the moral of what I was saying about the shift example. 
the order here, like, so it's tempting to think that this order is the order of cause and effect, right? So like, but this perception is or represents the cause and this one represents the effect and the effect has to come after the cause. But actually this order is an order of effects, right? Like the object effect would be this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. Um, so, like, similar, so, like, when Kant talks about the boat example, he says, you know, um, you can't see the boat downstream first and then upstream. You have to see them upstream first and then downstream. But the boat upstream is not the cause of the boat downstream. Rather, the continuing action of the substance is what produces that necessary succession in, in the boat. First, first they're up here, and then they're down there. Um, that's why you can always see them. You have to see them upstream first and then downstream. Um, All right, so so like so that generally so so like generally speaking, the way we expect the argument to work is is to say um, so uh, every empirical object must every empirical concept must represent its object as um, cause and effect. Of course, not as cause and effect in the same relation, right? But as cause related to some objects and as effect related to other objects. Every empirical concept must represent its object as cause and effect. Um, the way the schema of cause and effect, um, and you know, why must it? Well, you know, roughly speaking, because cause and effect is one of the principles of necessity, uh, necessary relation. And we need them, we need to use all of them to represent uh, something as an external object. So um, regularity of succession in the perceptions is the way the imagination can schematize that. And therefore there must be that regularity. Um, And then, of course, so in what sense is this an answer to Q? I mean, so it doesn't show, uh, and Kant doesn't want it to show that um, some particular regularity is in their perceptions is known in advance, right? So, like, he agrees with Hume that you know we can only tell by like what causes and effects there are by examining our actual experiences. Um, and therefore, it, the result is never strictly universal or necessary. Right? So like this is an example of the universal law of gravitation, but that's the very case, all bodies are heavy, where Kant said, you know, you can tell this is not a, a, priori, a priori principle because it's not strictly universal or necessary. There could be an exception. Right, so it's like the result of induction. So, I mean, you might think you haven't got much over you when you say that. Like, it doesn't tell you how you should be, how you can be certain about any specific empirical laws. But I mean, if it's like we're not certain about specific empirical laws, so you shouldn't have an explanation of that, right? But what, but, but what it is an answer to is you saying. Um, you don't have uh, so much as rational grounds for starting to think that this law works, right? Like you don't have evidence for it. And you can't because um, you don't even know what you're asking for. You're asking for necessity in the order of your ideas, but you'll never find necessity. 
so it's like a mistake. You mistake something which is purely subjective, a, a tendency to go from one idea to another for um, uh, something that could really be used to set up this analogy that it's like lost visibly necessary connection. A visibly necessary connection doesn't exist. But if you start to think as if it existed, then you can't help yourself, <laughs> right? That's Hobbes, that's Hume's conclusion. And Hobbes says, no, no, it does exist. And we can prove a priori that it exists. There is some necessary connection. And now we're just trying to figure out which one of it. So we're not sure we're there yet, but we have evidence, right? And we're never sure we're there yet, but we always have evidence. Um, and we know that evidence is evidence of something. We're just not sure exactly what. <laughs> so it really is a big uh, difference to think. And, you know, I mean, um, I guess like a lot of things, it's ultimately important to concept of the ethics. You know, like I have to be able to think of my actions as having consequences. Um, not the context you can derive moral principles from the consequences of actions, but ne but you couldn't have moral principles at all if, if actions didn't have expected consequences, right? Like you couldn't have a principle don't lie if uh, you couldn't like expect that when you make a noise, someone else will hear it. Uh -huh. So okay, there would be no such thing as law. Right. So it's um, uh, um, uh, and if you say, well, we're not sure, it's not a universe, strictly universal and necessary rule, it, it kind of will say, well, you always know enough to do your duty, meaning like the duty is to act on your best information. So, I mean, I but I mean, but 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 of course, it's not only relevant for that. It's also relevant for explaining what we're doing in empirical science. Like, are we doing anything? Or not? Uh, okay. So so anyway, so that's like how we expect the, the argument to work overall. Then if then if you look into the details of the actual proofs, it gets confusing trying to explain how this works. Um. Which time do I have? Okay. I'm out. So, um, so now I'm going to start from a different, although obviously somehow related direction. I mean, so, which is, which is supposed to connect with what Tom actually says. So, um, Like, so, okay, so suppose that like Hobbes or Hume, um, you think all our empirical knowledge is built on association, right? So like an association means basically if you have the ideas A and B together many times in the past, now when you get A, your imagination supplies B. By association. And Kant, remember, agrees that this is basically the way the empirical imagination works. So the question is like, for this view, however, what's the difference between merely associating A and B and expecting B given A? So, I mean, and, you know, uh, I started thinking about this actually when I was teaching 144 and trying to understand Hobbes. <laughs> so, like, you know, because Hobbes uses this type of association to explain how it is that we come to expect certain, like, um, good or evil that is ultimately speaking pleasurable or painful. Uh, consequences from certain procedures. 
right? And he says, well, uh, you know, the way that works. Now, they, by the way, Hobbes says, and this isn't science. Science has to all go through definitions. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. This is mere empirical knowledge. Whatever. So, but in any case, um, uh, he says, like, the way it works is that we experience painful or pleasurable consequences from those things in the past, and now we associate them. So we expect the same consequences again. So what does it mean that we expect? So, like, uh, if, if you get the perception A, so I understand what it means that uh, it calls to mind also the perception B. But, you know, um, that could be, what, what's to say that this isn't, um, supposing that B must have happened before? Or thinking that B must also be right now? Right? I mean, all we know is that all, all I know is that I've got A and now B comes to mind. But what makes it an expected consequence of that? So, um, so, like, here's how you might think of it that no, so the association works like this like in the past, you saw A, and then later you saw B. So now when you get A, you don't just get the idea of B, but you get the idea of B at some later time. So B comes with a little like time label. And um, I think Hans argument in the analogy starts by saying, but there are no such time labels. Right, or as he keeps saying, time itself cannot be perceived. Right, it's not true that you can imagine B at a specific time. I mean, of course, when you imagine B, you imagine B at some time because time is a universal condition that intersects, right? So you can't imagine B as not at any time. But you can't imagine B as a particular time. The imagination of B, remember that imagination just is declining the intuitive representation of B even without B's presence, right? So um, uh, it's it's always the same B. It's always the same perception. You can't imagine it. The whole point of it is that it's that that although it's not present, you're imagining it at present. Um, you can't imagine it at, as at some other time. Does it? I mean, I can explain, I, you know, like bringing in Tom's particular explanation of what time is, I can explain this better. But, you know, that again, the time is all one thing. That every inner intuition um, is an act of the same faculty of. Of, of inner reception, and that faculty is time, right? Like the ability to receive things. So, um, so when you say time itself can't be perceived, it obviously can't be perceived because it's it's nothing but the capability of perceiving something. It's not the object of perceiving. But, um, but like I think you don't even have to bring that in to see why. Like, I think Kant is kind of obviously right about. Right, that when you imagine something, I mean, if you try to imagine something at a specific time, all you can do is represent is imagine it at the same time as some other time. But can't like if you just try just try try to imagine a red dot five minutes from now. Like how is that's not any different from imagining a red dot now or a red dot five minutes ago. There's no, there are no little time labels. 
So, um, so if there's a time direction to the imagination, um, it doesn't come from the contents of the like perceptions that the imagination is bringing in by association. Rather, it comes from the concept that the imagination is trying to see. So, like, um, You know, the concept of a house uh, is consistent with a certain order of life receiving first the bottom of the house, then the middle of the house, then the top of the house. This is not an example. But it's also consistent with my receiving first the left, and then the middle, and then the right. Um, or for the top, and you know, like the order is that concept doesn't prescribe an order to those events. They, that still is an order of events, right? First, the house affected me this way, and then it affected me another way. And you know, uh, like in accordance with the conclusion of the second analogy, there is a reason that those events happen in that order. But as long as we're focused on the concept house, it doesn't prescribe any order to those events. Um, and therefore, uh, when the imagination, like, if I perceive the front of the house, the imagination by association brings in my representation in the front of the house. Not like that, you know, it's not that. Okay, so, uh, um, like, the imagination by association brings in the back of the house. But because the, the concept doesn't prescribe any order, um, this can't be described as the imagination bringing in this, like, as after this. Um, if there is a case where um, one is after the other, um, it has to be because the concept requires one after the other. Um, so, um, So, in other words, it's not as Hume thinks that because the because the like because the imagination has a tendency to supply B after A, we therefore start to think that he represents B as necessarily after. Right. So, I don't know how to draw this, but. So, but, so according to Hume, what happens first is that the imagination acquires a tendency to supply B after A. And then we get a kind of concept, but it's illegitimate, right? It's like illusory, where we feel like um, there's a necessary relation. Right. 
right? So this happens first. That you know, the imagination starts to find B after A, and then the result of that is that we start to feel like there's a necessity for B coming after A. But according to Kant, it can't work that way because there's no such thing as the imagination to apply an intention to supply B after A. Right? The imagination has to supply B with A. Um, and, you know, of course, it's always A or B that comes first, but the imagination doesn't represent one of them as first and the other as, as later. Because, again, because it can't, because there are no little time labels in the imagination. Right? It just, it just represents them as with them, right? Like as associated with them. So instead, Hobbes says it has to go the other way around. First, we represent a necessary connection. And then from that, the, associ the association of the imagination now gains the characteristic of, of being B after A. Right? There's, it's because the concept requires B after A and not A after B that now this association with the imagination is produced and described as supplying B after A. Um, so, like, this is just, I think this is what Kant is talking about. Um, um, so this is on B219 and it's Kemp Smith page 209. Um, so, uh, but since experience is a knowledge of objects of objects through perception, the relation in the existence of the manifold has to be represented in experience. And there's some problem with the text here. Yeah not as it is put together in time, but as it exists objectively in time. Since time, however, cannot itself be perceived, the determination of the existence of objects in time can take place only through their relation in time in general, and therefore only through concepts that connect them a priori. I, I I mean I don't think that passage I still don't think that passage is super easy to understand but I think at least I understand what he's saying about concepts have to come in right that the, the, because the um, for an empirical concept to work that is for an empirical concept to be a possibly a representation of something distinct from the perception. Um, it uh, has to um, um, This is where I'm running up to the fact that I don't know how to put together this stuff because the other stuff I've seen before. Right? Like exactly where how does this come together with the category of cause and effect must be seen in that. I mean. So you say in the last part I read there, you know, because time itself can't be perceived, that um, the 
uh, order can only be represented through a constant. So the necessity is something that we ask for in the perception, not something that uh, we could ever see in the perception. Maybe this is just a way of filling in what I'm trying to say here about like, or, you know, or, or what I kind of glossed over here. Why does it make no sense? Why does Locke's view make no sense? Could we just see the necessary connection? Well, I don't really like that. But that makes sense. The fact that the order has to be an order of time has to be unique. I think you know that's the hard thing about this proof that that like as I said, said to begin with seems like it could be really relatively easy to understand but the more you think about it there seem to be too many pieces <laughs> I mean it's not clear which one comes first and how they relate to the overall plot of the book like you know I understand on the one hand you know like abstractly why there has to be an order to the perceptions that like images type of order that we find in the object of that we must find in the object of any empirical concept. And I also understand, I think, why um, Why we can only represent an objective order of perceptions at all. You know, so like, what does that mean? We're always having one perception, but that's not a representation of any order of perception, right? So, a representation of an order of perceptions always involves the imagination. We have to bring in other ones that we're not having. And the point is, as you can't see that at all, unless um, you have a, yeah, I guess so. Okay, roughly speaking, this is the way it goes together. Um, um, we can't represent any order at all unless it's a necessary order contained in some concept. And the ways concepts can contain, can contain necessary orders or must contain necessary orders are the three categories of relation. Um, um, once you have that, then you can demand the, the imagination conforms to it. Still seems like it's too much. In other words, because I mean, because the conclusion is supposed to be like the manifold of intuitions must be such that the imagination can do what it needs to do there. Yeah, I guess, you know, so I mean, I guess the right way to put it is that um, necessity must be something we demand in our concept. And then the imagination can be, can be uh, regarded as representing an order. However, the, rep the imagination could still fail to represent, right? Like we fail to meet that demand. So, I mean, it's like, uh, if we actually see the boat going up the river, then whatever concept we're trying to apply there, gravitation or however you can look at what the concept there is, then no, the concept is. Um, 
Have a motion. Careful concept of motion. Despite the fact that the represents motion is dependent on an external condition that is of an effect. Right. So anyway, like uh, you know, we can we can try to apply it and find that it doesn't work. Um, so then we know that like um, the order is not the order that our concept is by. Um, and you might think that would always happen. Right? So like you might think that the, the, the associations we form are such that, you know, imagination would never succeed in producing things in the right order to conform to any empirical concept. Um, like the, for example, the expectation, right? That is given the concept. Now we can, yeah, maybe this is what I should have said to begin with. Given the concept, now we can regard this association as an expectation of B given A. Before, without the concept, it's just A associated with B. So with the concept, it's an expectation of B given A. Now it's like because it's now an expectation, it can be frustrated. You see it. No, we don't see it. Like the old without the concept, it would uh we see a we don't see B wouldn't frustrate us. Right? That's like saying we see the front of the house and we don't see the back of the house. Well, we're not seeing the back of the house now, we see the front. But with the concept, now this becomes an expectation, and therefore. Our next perception cannot conform to. It. So, uh, but what the highest principle of all synthetic judgment shows is that um, there must be some concept we can use where uh, where it wouldn't be frustrated. Our expectation, the expectation that the concept prescribed wouldn't be frustrated. There must be at least one such concept because I have to be able to represent, represent myself as um, a single empirical thing that continues to exist in time. Um, I think I just managed to throw all the pieces together, but I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, it's very on the fly. I hope, I hope that's at least entertaining, but not informative. Um, and I'll just say one more thing, which is that um, in the reading for today, the reputation of idealism, where I mean, it really kind of relies on the result of the first analogy more than on the second analogy, where, where Kant says, and by the way, I can't just represent myself as the only empirical um, because um, for reasons similar to the reasons I'm putting here about succession, like I can't represent um, events as either simultaneous or after one another unless I represent them relative to some permanent thing. And he says, no permanent thing is given an inner sense. Right, like inner sense just contains a series of, um, of my inner perceptions. Um, again, agreeing with Hume, right? There's no idea that continues throughout my life that I can call the idea of myself. But Kant says, on that basis, therefore, I have to represent my, my inner states as all lying in relation to something permanent but external to me that is a body. That, roughly speaking, is the argument of the reputation of idealism. If you ask what body is that, I think to begin with, it's my body, right? That is, we're showing that um, my inner states must be connected to a permanent body, right? Then you can use the other analogy to show that that body has to be in community with other bodies and so forth. Um, okay, that's all or more than I have time for. Um, thank you, and I'll see you on Tuesday.